I'm Diane Shader Smith, and I'm here to talk about Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life, written by my daughter, Mallory Smith. Mallory was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at the age of three. The doctor sounded hopeful when they told me that the lifespan had changed from five to 25, and they expected it to get even longer. But all Mark and I heard was that our child had an expiration date. I was desperate for a way to explain the disease to Mallory and to her brother Micah, but there was no children's book about CF back then, so I wrote one. Mallory's 65 Roses. 65 Roses is what kids hear when adults say cystic fibrosis. We read it to her class every September. We gave a copy to each of her friends and even the boys when she started dating because it provided an easy way to explain her illness, which for so long was invisible. That book taught Mallory the power of narrative. Mallory had a happy childhood, and she was always compliant about her treatments. But one day when she was nine, she came home and she said, I am not doing treatment anymore. At that point, Mark and I sat down with her, and we explained for the first time that CF could be fatal and it's why we needed her to do treatment. Mallory ran out of the room crying and she did not speak to us for three days. But after that, she never missed a treatment. And she also started writing, first in a spiral bound notebook and then at the age of 15 on a computer. Mallory lived every day knowing she had a chronic illness that would someday kill her. It's why she wrote so much. To set the tone for Mallory's life, I adopted a mantra, no pity party. And my goal was to find the joy in every day. Mallory went on to adopt her own mantra, which was live happy. Family was always important to Mallory. In high school, she was a straight A student. She was a three sport varsity athlete. And she was prom queen. Transition to college was very hard. After growing up with a helicopter mom, <laughs> I know I'm guilty, Mallory desperately wanted to be independent. But at the same time, she knew that having my help made things much easier for her. Mallory had to learn to juggle her academic, social, and medical needs in order to fit everything in. Over time, she adjusted. She studied hard, went to football games. She played club volleyball, despite many dozens of hospitalizations. And in total, there would be 67, ranging from weeks to month. In Mallory's junior year, she worked as a peer health educator in a freshman dorm. She was responsible for the social and emotional health of her residents. And it wasn't until taking this job that Mallory actually felt that she belonged at Stanford. During a writing exercise with her freshmen, she saw a pattern. The freshmen were super stressed out and they didn't feel like they belonged there. Mallory was able to reassure them that she too had felt the same way. And in fact, she writes about the duck syndrome. When students are like ducks gliding on the water, what no one sees is that underneath they are pedaling furiously. These are Mallory's words, quote, the stress of working to make things seem effortless creates a vicious cycle of silence and struggle. This applies to physical and mental health issues. Mallory had both. To manage her anxiety, Mallory spent a lot of time in nature. She cared deeply about the environment and desperately wanted to heal the planet. In her senior thesis at Stanford, she compared the degradation of her lungs by the colonization of a superbug to the degradation of native Hawaii by the colonization of foreigners. She recorded it as a podcast, and it played on NPR. You can hear it online. It's called Biome. The analogy that Mallory drew helped her process what was happening to her body, and it was terrifying. Of her fears, Mallory wrote, Quote, my memory, nearly photographic at times, serves me well in school, but it curses me at night. My internal hallucinations are so haunting I cannot escape them. Even when I close my eyes because the images play on my eyelids as if projected on a movie screen. Fear protects us from dangerous things. Unwarranted fear prevents us from reaching our full potential. Despite her demons, Mallory did reach her full potential, graduating from Stanford Phi Beta Kappa. She was so excited to do field work, but doctors said no to every single project she asked about because they said that the exposure to environmental toxins would further damage her lungs. 
Mallory was devastated. No one understood her distress. Mallory still looked so healthy that everybody thought she was the golden girl who had it all, and she would have traded everything she had for the chance to take a breath that didn't hurt or to have a life that wasn't defined by illness. As her body deteriorated, she sharpened her mind, crystallized her thinking, and honed her writing skills. Mallory would write, I am limited in what I can do, but not in what I can say. Negative feelings hurt creativity, the very same creativity that will help you reinvent your possibilities and achieve your dreams. Mallory did reinvent her possibilities without giving up on her dream. Instead of doing physical work to help the environment, she wrote a book about the importance of using native plants and gardening for wildlife. The publication of the Gottlieb Native Garden, covered by the New York Times and the Associated Press, enabled Mallory to realize that she could still make a difference despite her increasing limitations. The book received a lot of acclaim, but when she should have been on book tour, celebrating as all the authors here are today, she landed back in the hospital and she was dealing with things like IVs, ICUs, and indignities. Having nurses ask about her bowel habits in front of her friends and boys she might be dating, even though she asked them not to, and it was humiliating. Mallory was also in a serious amount of pain. The opioid epidemic has left the medical community working to regain control over prescribing patterns, and as a result, well-meaning doctors and nurses would routinely underprescribe pain meds out of their fears that they would be creating another addict if they increased the doses. Mallory writes a lot about her distress at inadequate pain management, and yet at another point in her journal, she writes about her own fears of getting addicted, and these are her words. Quote, I never thought I would say this, but I have come to love the feeling of being on opioids. They were never part of my treatment, but as my chest pain became unbearable, I needed them to breathe. They also helped with my mood. With morphine and with oxy, there is no pain and there is no sadness. In 2016, when Mallory's bacteria had grown resistant to all antibiotics, the only choice left was transplant. UPMC was the one center in the country and the only one that would take her complicated case. But as an out-of-state, out-of-network hospital, coverage was denied. And I will tell you that the hardest non-medical battle that we ever fought was trying to get her insurance. Mallory would write, Blue Cross is intentionally trying to run the clock out of my life with its stall tactics. Mallory was eventually approved, but she was racked with guilt because so many of her friends had died waiting because they were not able to overturn their denials. I urged Mallory, who by then it was very clear was a gifted writer, to use the power of the pen to expose this injustice. She documents the entire battle. Her written testimony has resonated. In February of 26, Mallory arrived in Pittsburgh, and we were there to await transplant. Once you are listed, you're tethered to your phone because you cannot miss a single call. So those days, what happened was our heightened vigilance starts to turn into hopelessness because you think that call isn't going to come, or if it does come, it's going to come too late. So I changed my mantra to somewhere over the rainbow, there are lungs. And I would sing that line to Mallory over and over every day. In the seven months it took to get lungs, Mallory experienced three dry runs, which are false alarms. She writes about the emotional and physical toll this took on her. But finally, on September 11th of 2017, Mallory was wheeled into surgery. It was nine hours long, and the rehab was incredibly grueling. But one month later, we were celebrating her 25th birthday. Those days, I used to sing to Mallory, somewhere over the rainbow, there were lungs. And you can see the rainbow on her cake and the smile on her face as we dared to dream about a new life. But tragically, just a few weeks later, Mallory was readmitted with pneumonia, and the doctors wanted me to tell Mallory that she was going to die. I refused, knowing that Mallory was terrified. This part of Mallory's story sets the stage for conversations about bioethics and end-of-life choices. In the last days of Mallory's life, Mark was working to get an experimental treatment for Mallory. Phage therapy had been used 100 years ago, but then penicillin was discovered. With its patent protection and financial incentives, penicillin rendered work on phage obsolete. Mark believed phage therapy could save Mallory, so he set about to get it. 
The United States Navy had been doing top secret work on phage therapy, and they found a match for Mallory's isolate. On November 14th, Mallory became the first patient with cystic fibrosis to receive phage therapy, and we were so hopeful the phages are in that white box. But the very next morning, doctors said that Mallory had been without oxygen for too long and advised us to make the gut-wrenching decision to remove life support. Once she died, we asked for an autopsy, and it proved that phages therapy had worked. They had reached their target, and they were doing what they were supposed to do. But Mallory just had not gotten them in time. We couldn't save our daughter, but Mark was determined to save others, so we worked with the media to make Mallory's case public. Since then, Mark has been instrumental in helping save other patients so that they didn't die and they were able to receive this important treatment. We also agreed to share Mallory's bacteria. Three students at the University of Jerusalem found a second fade match for Mallory, and they have named the bacteria killing virus BC Mallory 1, BC for Bucaldaria cepacea, Mallory after her name, and 1 because she's the first patient to have received it. Now I'd like to share how salt in my soul came to be. Mallory had kept her journal, written prolifically for 10 years, but she had kept it password protected for 10 years. In the last year of her life, she gave me the password. I first opened it the day of her memorial, and I found 2,500 pages. The playful writings of a teenager, the somber insights of a young woman facing death, and instructions for me to publish the part that would help others. The publisher called the manuscript life-changing. The LA Times calls it a memoir unlike any other. All the reviews have been phenomenal. To date, I've shared Mallory's story more than 100 times, and it didn't matter whether it was college classrooms, private high schools, large assemblies, religious schools, graduate schools, community events, ladies' lunches, or businesses. Mallory's story and her insight have been resonating. After every talk, people line up and they want to talk to me about their own stories of invisible illness, body image, fear, depression, anxiety, pain management, access to health care, grief, all of the things that Mallory writes about, whether it's the loss of a friend, a child, a parent, a teacher. How is Mallory able to craft such relatable writing, to create poetry out of prosaic experiences? Reading makes you a better writer, which is why so many writers are avid readers, and Mallory was no exception. She read voraciously, and she relates why writing was so important to her. Her words, quote, I read because the vast wholeness of existence, the immeasurable, multifaceted beauty of what it means to be human cannot be perceived through one life. I read to see things in my head that are not actually there, to know about emotions that I have never felt before, so that maybe if I do feel them, they'll be recognizable. At its core, Salt in My Soul is not just a story of a girl with an illness. It's a portrait of a coming of age with universal themes. Mallory writes about what so many students experience, wanting to fit in, feeling insecure, grappling with independence, worrying about the future about the importance of deep and meaningful friendships, her longing for love, which she ultimately found with Jack, and her desire to have a child, the most heartbreaking part for me to read. She writes about the quest to live happy in the face of overwhelming obstacles, and in doing so, Mallory teaches us about discipline, resilience, inspiration, and perspective. Mallory said that writing helped heal her. I just wish that she were here to see that her writing is healing others. Thank you.